welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast, where we are focused on bringing you information to help prevent and reverse brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a functional medicine physician in Cleveland, Ohio, and your host on this journey. So, whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have loved ones with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? You'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's and dementia. If you have questions or comments or just want to connect, please check us out on our Facebook page, or if you're old-fashioned like me, Google Evolving Past Alzheimer's Podcast, and you'll find us that way. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back to the show. This week, uh, we're going to start our attempt to speak about the world of conscious dance. And we have two very special guests with us, Kathy Altman and her partner, Lori Saltzman, who are the co-founders of Open Floor Dance. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So I'm really excited to be here with you uh, on this show because we've been interested in dance for a long time and we haven't yet uh, exposed our audience to the idea of conscious dance. And I know it's a big part of my life. And uh, I would I would just love for you guys to kind of give a brief introduction to who you are and and, and this idea of the open floor dance and, and conscious dance. If you could kind of just give us, maybe Kathy can start uh, or Lori can start uh, and tell us about yourself a little bit and then moving into what is open floor dance. Okay, good. Okay, well, I, I will start. This is Kathy. And I have danced my whole life. I started taking lessons in, it was called interpretive dance at that time when I was four years old. And I have studied almost every form of dance from ballet to Caribbean to African to modern dance and was a complete devotee of each one of those methodologies. And then I found the dance where I made up my own steps rather than studied someone else's choreography. And it changed my world. It changed my worldview. And that was back in uh, 1979 when I first met Gabrielle Roth, who is the founder and originator of the Moving Center, the study of her methodology, which is the five rhythms. And I studied with her for 40 years, loved her, taught her work for many, many years. And when she died, I felt the constraints of only working with one methodology. And so I joined up with Lori, obviously, my partner in many ways, and 17 other people from around the world. And we started looking at what are the universal principles in all conscious movement activities, whether they be conscious dance, yoga, Aikido, um, any of the places, any of the methodologies where you have to bring a quality of presence to them, not just study steps. Not that you don't bring presence to ballet. Don't get me wrong. I, of course you do, but there's a difference when you're making up your own steps, you're on your own edge in a certain way and brain wise for sure. And also creativity wise. And so we created Open Floor, which is really an embodiment practice. And what we mean by that, what we mean by conscious dance is, you know, you could go to a bar and rock out and I'm all for that. And I think that many people have had incredible peak experiences by going to a club or going to a rave. The difference with conscious dance, whatever form or methodology you want to Uh, use is that you bring consciousness to the process. How am I today versus how was I yesterday? What is actually happening inside of me and how do I embody it, move with it? How am I in terms of my social interaction right now? 
Do I need to dance by myself for a while to feel myself? Would it be better for me if I could dance with someone else and still hold to my own needs and recognitions? How am I in a group? Am I the one that always stands on the outside? Am I always the one that gets in the middle? This is a, it's fascinating to hear, um, to hear how you just describe all, all the dynamics. I, I want to um, turn to Lori for one second before Please. we get too far down the rabbit hole because um, you're deep into the kind of experience of this and you explained what conscious dance was so nicely. Uh, Lori, can you give your, your kind of story of how you got into this? And, and also yeah, sure. if you can also sort of describe what a conscious dance gathering might look like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, So in terms of my background, I'm a good counterpoint to Kathy in that I did not have a dance background. Uh, Not at all. In fact, I was very physical, very athletic, but dance was not on my calendar. And in fact, when my mother tried to send me for ballet lessons when I was four, because my sister had already taken them for three or four years and they were starting me after the first class, the ballet teacher said, uh, we're going to put this one in the tumbling and gymnastics <laughs> class. So I got kicked out of dance. I had, and you know, leaves you with a little dance wound, which I carried with me. And so when Kathy and I got together and she had already studied with Gabrielle for a few years and it was becoming the center of her world, she said to me, you've got to try this. You have to come with me. And I was terrified. Just like a lot of our students I know are terrified the first time Mm. they walk in the door. And, you know, the story I always tell is the first time I went, I insisted that we take separate (laughs) cars because I was sure I wouldn't stay. That's funny. (laughs) And uh, so, you know, that's, that's the story. And the moment I stepped into that practice, I never left. My whole life changed. And I said, this is what I'm doing. And the way that it's framed in a well-held conscious dance practice is that wherever you are, however you are, no matter whether you think you're a klutz or you're shy or you're aging, the facilitator is going to hold it in such a way that everyone can move the way they move. And so there's absolutely no way to do it wrong. And that's the beauty beautiful, of it. Uh, at least to, to me. And so is this is like people are getting together as a group of five people, 10 people, 50 people are getting together. Is, is somebody playing music? And when you say, is there, you say the facilitator, like, is this a formal thing or do people sort of show up in shorts? Like, what does it look like? You know, what does an experience look like? Well, what the typical open floor or most other conscious dance practices would look like is people come, we say dress to be able to move freely and know that you're probably going to sweat. So, and barefoot, or if you have sensitive feet, for some reason, you can wear a light shoe and we'll play music and get the bodies warmed up to start to quote unquote study. Although the warm up is part of the study as well. It's how do you bring yourself into a room? What kind of thoughts are going through your mind? We might drop a few things into the warm up so people can, start to stretch and be safe as they enter into the practice. And then the teacher will typically have a topic. Maybe it's partnering. How do I dance alone and one-on-one with another person? And how, what can I notice about myself in that? The things that we're working towards in open floor are two primary values. There's lots of, you know, underpinnings in the curriculum that our teachers are very studied in, but we're looking to, for two things. One is we want to help people move from fixed to fluid, meaning physically, because people come in, everybody has fixed kind of dance moves or movement Mm -hmm. uh, patterns and that we're trying to open that up and extend into new territory. Because when you shift the body, the psyche, the heart, the mind all start to shift as well. We know they're, they're not separate things. And the same with emotional fluidity. 
I mean, that kind of, that kind of goes without saying that a lot of us have some pretty fixed emotional patterns. That's just human. And how do we extend and get out of the boxes we live in through movement? And a skilled facilitator is going to, for the most part, make it pretty inviting and in, in a step-like manner, I don't mean prescribed steps, but you just fall into it. The, that you don't feel like you're taking a huge leap out of your comfort zone. And we just ease people into now try this and now try that. And what if you did that really slowly? Or what if you speeded that up? Or what if you took bigger steps around the room, now smaller steps? All these kind of very easy, anybody can do it, but it all adds up to a pretty intense and beautiful and expanding experience. And the other main principle is move and include. And we mean that on many levels, because when we move, things come up. Anything that we have been holding tightly in our bodies will start to soften and feelings come up or shynesses, or you may be stuck in your head because you just left work and you can't get out of your head and you're frustrated. Whatever comes that gets included in the dance, not pushed away. So in the deepest sense, we turn the things we struggle with and against into an art form. It makes for a very interesting dance to dance. Yeah, that's, that is a head. fascinating concept. And I'm, right. I'm not sure I've yeah. ever heard anybody say it exactly like that. So, so I'm, cause I'm wondering in, as you're talking here, why would someone come to an open floor dance or a conscious dance? Why not go to a club or why not go to a ballroom dance or why not just like, dance in their living room. I mean, what, you know what I mean? Why would, why do, why do people come when they come? Yeah. I, Kathy, I think you wanna... there's many reasons why people come. I think number one, people are pretty isolated more often than not, even if they work in a, uh, an environment with other people, there's a lot of isolation. We're very myopic. Everybody's looking at a screen. And so, yes, of course you can dance in your living room. And in fact, I highly recommend it. But if you want to dance in the presence of other people, you go someplace where there are other people. And the difference between going to a club and going to some place like Open Floor is you're not using substances to alter you. In fact, you're not trying to alter yourself in that way. You're trying to actually be more authentically yourself without the use of altered, of substances that will alter you. So I think that's two very, very important reasons. People want community and they want community where you don't necessarily agree on all your belief systems, but there's a shared passion. and. Many people love to dance. And so you can share a passion without necessarily agreeing with each other politically, psychologically, emotionally. There's all kinds of ways that you can feel oneness with a group of people without having to give up your personal preferences, so to speak. I also wanted to talk about fixed to fluid. There's also a way with the, in which the opposite is also true, that sometimes we're so fluid, we don't even know what we believe. We don't even know what we think. We don't even know how we feel. And part of coming to conscious dance where there is instruction, where somebody is facilitating process, you get to know yourself better. What am I actually feeling? I'm moving so fast, I can't even figure out what I'm feeling. What is that? How does that move? Every thought, every mind state, every emotional state, every physical state has movement attached to it. We try and include all of that in open floor classes. Mm, Nice. So what you keep saying somebody facilitates it. Um, what does that look like? What is what is a facilitator's role and how do they interact? This is a, presumably a group of a dozen or a couple dozen people. What is a facilitator doing here? Laura, do you want to 
Yeah, sure. I'm going to back up for one second to the difference between dancing at a party, even if you're not doing substances. I think a really key difference that helps explain what we're doing to people who have never done it before is that we are dancing to learn, not learning to dance. The byproduct of studying open floor and other practices is that you may stop identifying as someone who doesn't dance because guess what? You're dancing every week. (laughs) But that the primary purpose, I mean, there's always a place and we have open community dances every weekend and hundreds of people come to these dances just to dance. The teacher holds the space and welcomes everyone, maybe sets a little intention, and then they play music for an hour and a half, two hours. But in terms of the instruction, we really are there to learn about ourselves and each other and how we are in the world and get mindful of how we are. We always say, whatever you do on the dance floor is what you do outside the dance floor. So it's a wonderful playground, learning ground that's you know, a lot more fun than sitting in (laughs) psychotherapy all the time. Not that it's a substitute for psychotherapy because there's a a very big place for Mm. that in our world, but it's a really beautiful way to learn about yourself. So, and back to your question about the facilitate. Yeah. Well, we train teachers uh, since we started open floor, we've trained about 200, 250 teachers on just about every continent. And they study psychological process through the body. They study embodied mind. They study the relationship between soul and spirit on the dance floor and how to help people connect with something larger than themselves, which is what all cultures have always shared, that people dance together to celebrate. They also dance to release They also dance to tell stories and they dance to be part of the big field, something larger than themselves. So our teachers, we train them in every one of these levels. There are so many levels going on in the room. For some people, it's totally physical. I just don't want to trip over my own two feet and I want to be able to move more of my body and not be so frozen. It's the place where a lot of people start. But our teachers are trained in what happens when emotional things come up on the dance floor. How do you hold it, learn from it, include it, and have everyone in the room learn something Mm -hmm. from it, from including the way we feel. And they, they learn how to create really evocative soundscapes, we call them, where They will include emotional music, anything from classical to jazz to hip hop to electronic to (laughs) opera, right? It's very varied. Every teacher has a style, but our teachers, yeah, our teachers use a very broad range of music, which also goes along with move and include because a piece of music or a genre that may really, really move me, You, it might leave yeah. you cold. It might be hard for you to dance to it. So we kind of scoop everybody up into the stream with really varied soundscapes. And depending on what we're teaching, the soundscape will yeah. support so cool. what we're trying to So cool. So what are, like, mm-hmm. what are some observations or experiences that people will describe to you going through open floor. I'm t- talking about dancers and participants more so than um, facilitators. And I- I'm sorry, I, you go okay. ahead because I didn't hear that question. It broke up a little. All right, I'll start and then you can jump in. Well, a couple of things that, you know, I've been teaching movement for about 30 years now. There's one experience that is really consistent. And when I've shared this with other teachers, of really solid conscious dance practices. They've, they've said, yes, I know that one. It happens to me too. When people come in for the first time and they may be very resistant or not sure that they can do this and frightened and a little, uh Oh, what am I going to do here? By the end 
of the first session, it doesn't happen to everybody, but it is very common that one of those people who was walked in looking like a deer in headlights will come up at the end of the class and say, I feel like I just came home. Yeah. That some place in themselves that got left behind, which is our native physical movement intelligence, and that we are all dancers uh, at, at, at the deepest level. It's part of our neurological evolutionary structure. They feel that they remembered it. They had forgotten and they remembered it. And it's often very emotional. People are very touched and they then come back and back. And the other thing that I hear a lot is the, the community becomes very important. That, like you were saying when we were speaking before, that you dance every week and it's a highlight of your week. And I know tens of thousands of people now who would say the exact same thing. Yeah, it's very much, I agree um, with your characterization there, Lori, which is that for most people, whether they consider themselves a a dancer, a dance aficionado, good at dance, athletic, it doesn't matter. I mean, we have people that sit in a chair uh, and this is just sort of an, an innate rhythmic thing. Like it has not so much to do with dance because, you know, I think like you, were, like you guys were saying before, particularly Kathy, which was, you know, dance without choreography just sort of changed her whole life. If, for me too, um, you know, we had some formal dance training in the past. And when I discovered just dancing without following someone else's sort of prescriptive yes. formulations, I was able then to express what I was thinking, what I'm feeling. Yes. And it's really, really mm-hmm. difficult to kind of language these things in these types of conversation. It really is something that I, I feel like kind of has to be experienced. It's like you can describe the what a peach tastes like until you're blue in the face, but you know, you can't have to sort of taste it. Yes. Well, it it also goes back to the neuroscience of dance. They are actually doing studies on the type of dance we're talking about, which is where you have to be on your own edge and figure out the next step without being told what the next step is. And it is actually building uh, plus, you know, uh, much more plasticity in the brain. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're finding that it is one of the markers for the lack of dementia, much more so than uh, swimming or a golf or, or even dance with steps. So there's all kinds of neuroscience to support the fact that this kind of social dancing actually is a risk reducer in terms of dementia. And they've done this, you know, long-term studies in, in, in this field. We rewire here. I also wanted to go back to one other thing and then please ask the question. I hope you can remember the question you were going to ask is, You don't have to stand up in order to dance. In fact, one of the hallmarks of our work is that we actually put out dancing chairs that as the population ages and even when it's not about age, there's sometimes mobility issues that people feel would limit their ability to come onto a dance floor. We do not ascribe to that. We definitely feel like you don't have to stand up in order to dance. In fact, you could use your imagination and still dance, even if you have trouble moving. If you have angina and you can't dance vigorously, you could sit down and take in the view of other people dancing and dance with them in your imagination. That's part... Yes. It's part of it, right? Yeah. I mean, we absolutely, we, we, I just tell you and reflect on what you're saying. So we have, you know, we have several people that are in their 
70s and a couple in their 80s that come around every once in a while. And people with orthopedic yeah. injuries, joint replacements. We had a guy who had a heart attack during during yeah. the dance not too long ago. He was back the, the last the next week and the week after that. I mean, he got a he got yeah. a stent placed right. and that was it. He was right back. And it's amazing just because mostly because of Ken, what you were kind of saying about this is really a. Um, a practice there's for some no people. Question. It's, uh, you know, it's like meditation or something yes. like that. And then, and then there's also the community, right? There's a certain sense of just commonality. We're doing something that we all understand that we cannot really communicate truly effectively in words, but we share this experience on a regular basis. And that becomes a very special, uh, I would dare to say, sacred part of someone's kind of normal rhythm of their life. Well, we're communicating all the time. We just might not be doing it Mm -hmm. verbally. And that's part of conscious dance is to be able to actually read those signals in somebody else, in the group body as well, and it is in yourself, is... I think one of the things besides community and that feeling of coming home is we are not often encouraged to be authentic. And I think that that's one of the byproducts of dancing regularly in a group is every time you step onto that floor, you have to take your own measurements. And the more authentic you are, the better you are at it. Nobody is asking you to be other than who you are. And I think that's a rare, sacred, special thing. Yeah. In a long-term community like we have here, we've had, we've been working here in in this Bay Area community for almost 40 years teaching. And so there there are people who still come to dance with us who are at the first class believe it or not. And the community just continues to grow. Hundreds and hundreds of people have come through this place. And so in the development of this community, one of the things that's developed is we hear feedback that it's a particularly welcoming community. If you're passing through town, you've never been there before. People often mention the feeling of kindness and attention from the quote unquote old timers so that it doesn't feel like an Mm in-crowd, out-crowd kind of thing, which is easy to feel when you're new in a room and there's 150 (laughs) people dancing. The other thing is, in terms of community, because we've been here so long term, we've had so many people who, you know, have lived life. And so we've had deaths in our community. We have people who have divorced. We have people who have lost children, tragedies, as well as people who danced until they gave Mm. birth that night so that we are a community. We celebrate and we grieve together. And that's what community is for. And to, you know, the hunger to belong somewhere is a very powerful force. And people who feel they don't belong anywhere are physically at risk, psychologically at risk. And if we're going to link it to the dementia situation, much higher risk of dementia when people are not socially connected and feel like they belong somewhere. And with dance, and I'm sure you know this for yourself, right now we, we, the, we look at a lot of press of people who belong to opposing mm-hmm. groups. <laughs> that seems to be what's filling the mm-hmm. airwaves now. And the truth is this kind of practice joins people from different backgrounds in what they love by what they love, not right. their belief system, not their politics. No one says at the door when they're taking tickets, welcome to open floor. Right. Who did you vote for? You know, it, it's a f- politics free zone and it's medicine for these times. It's total medicine yeah, for yeah. people. I, I particularly like the combination of some really you know good, good music, a good playlist, a good DJ and, and, and the dance. It's really, really uh, sort of adds a whole nother layer of of uh, richness to to the experiences that and, those we're having fun. here. Um, you you guys it's have been fun. These, yeah, it's totally fun. No, yeah. I mean, that's like that's the bottom line for. You know, I don't think any of us would be doing it just if it was to right. meditate. You know, you can meditate in your house. I don't think any of us would just be doing it. You can go to a lot of places for for community, but this it's sort of all these things stacked together that I find particularly appealing. If you you guys said that you have been doing this for you know if people 
that were at the original offerings, the original dances that you would uh, uh, host and, you know, spanning over three, four decades. And things change in our bodies, uh, as you know, when from the time somebody's in their mid twenties, uh, all the things you can do physically, you know, in, as in, in, in a dance and things may change as people get into their forties, as people go into their sixties, as people move on into their eighties. How do you deal with those things? You know, the mind still can do a lot, you know, all the same things that maybe the body uh, can't. How do you guys deal with those types of you call them challenges or opportunities over time? Are you talking about personally or how we direct others? Both. Yeah, both. Well, um, is there a big difference? I don't know. Yeah. You tell me. Well, <laughs> why don't you speak as the elder here? <laughs> well, I, I will tell you one of my personal practices and you know how to learn it the hard way. I used to get up and basically, you know, jump onto that floor at, you know, in my teens and in my 20s. And as I started to dance as my profession, I I taught dance professionally, I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, got to prepare the body. And so now I don't just jump onto that floor. I have a whole routine that I personally do that uses stretching and rollers. And, you know, I prepare my body better and I find I'm able to dance longer, maybe not as hard as I used to. I don't pound the way I used to, but I'm still out there for a solid two hour class without uh, Mm. stopping or sitting down. That's not at all a problem. Uh, And I think the body starts to acclimate to, if you keep on doing a certain thing long enough, the body gets used to that. So I'm a big proponent of not stretching, but finding your range of motion that day and then using different tools to help you make the muscles more available, softer, more supple for movement. So that that's one of the things that I, I really believe in. And I've read many articles from professional dancers, ball, you know, prima ballerinas. They spend 45 minutes doing their floor work before they ever get up on their feet. So I really recommend that. And I recommend a real routine of it. It's also for me and what I try to transmit to others, because I did start this work in my 20s and I'm in my 60s now. It's also a beautiful metaphor for how we embrace the aging process, because we don't have the same bodies. And what, you know, a focus on what still moves. You know, we have people who just had both knees replaced, so they're going to be in a chair. What still moves? And yes, of course, what Kathy's talking about, taking care of your body, but also making that transition into the next life cycle. And if you look at indigenous cultures where they don't have a big story about dance, it's not about perfection or performance. It's about community and unity and it's as natural ritual ritual it's like saying i'm not going to breathe anymore to say i'm not going to dance and you look at people from those cultures elders dance until they die and they dance differently but there's a richness in a mature body that has decades of life in it that is actually really potent. It's not big, it's potent. And it's a gorgeous dance. We have a lot of people who are even older Mm -hmm. than us. (laughs) We used to be the youngest people in the room, but that's changed. And they're absolutely gorgeous to see all the life that has been lived by that body and the piece of art that it is now. And so we really encourage, you know, even though there'll be people getting really excited and they're, they are, they do have 30 year old knees, not 80 year old knees. So they're leaping in the air and sweating and really encouraging, including what your body wants to do and what it doesn't. And whatever it wants to do, do it with your whole heart. 
and it will be beautiful. Mm. Actually, inspirational. And so it's a both a physical change. Yes. <laughs> well, we yes. actually have a very dear friend who she's, seven. I think, yeah. 87 mm-hmm. or 80, yes. 87. And she started dancing with us maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. So she was already one of the elders in the room. And now she's coming close to 90. And she stopped coming for a while. And I thought maybe something happened to her or she wasn't feeling well. And she said, I really got tired of people coming up to me and saying, you're such an inspiration. She said, I'm just there to dance. I don't want to be anybody's inspiration. (laughs) And so, but you can't help it when you watch her move. You just can't help it. Yes. She's earned it. She's earned it. And it it is inspirational because it is unusual in this culture to see older people move and dance. Usually that's a young people's thing. And, you know, and that's so much one of the things that I like about what you were talking about and what I see in our group where it's not, um, you know, if you go to a club or you go to one of these, I mean, that's completely is a bizarre thing. You know, that's considered a bizarre thing. If somebody that is older, it's creepy or something like that would be there perhaps. And here in these types of situations, we're looking for it. It's encouraged. Uh, and I encourage is probably the wrong word, but it's, it's, natural. it's just part of it. You know what I mean? It's, 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 yes. natural, it's normal. Yeah. Natural. It's natural. The age range is beautiful and vast. We have young people in the room. We have older people in the room and everything. Yeah, in it's between. real life. It's real life. Nobody's excluded. And yeah. the space is held in right. such a way that nobody's excluded. So, yeah. That's wonderful. So you guys are in the what I call the hotbed uh, of conscious dance, as it were, in the United States, in Northern California. A lot of different dances on a week-to-week basis, day-to-day basis yes. during the week. Can, you know, if you're willing to drive a little bit, you can probably find something uh, mm-hmm. most of the days of the week. What's your suggestion for, uh, we have listeners really from many different countries and, and continents, but what is your suggestion for how somebody might kind of crack this open for themselves, where can they start? Are there any resources out there? Is there any place to look? Well, like, you, know? you know, there are many, many conscious dance practices, and most of them have websites, and they have schedules and listings of their teachers all over the yes. world. We have the open floor dot org website that you can go on that website and see all what all those 200 teachers are doing around the world and pick the closest one ditto with other practices soul motion and dancing freedom and five rhythms they're all movement medicine yeah these are all very very well developed practices so and yeah so that, that's that's a great place to start. That's a great place to start. Just just looking around mm-hmm. for movement medicine, soul emotion, five rhythms, and yes. they all have websites. Um, but there's another possibility here, which is if you really want to dance with people in your local community, and there is no one that is facilitating something like this, then maybe it's your turn to step up and you know, find a playlist on Spotify or create your own weird and wacky little mix of songs you love and invite a few of your friends and start to build your community. You know, if you build it, they will come. And that's great. You know, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys joining us for what I hope to be the first of uh, several talks on on dance and movement and conscious dance, you guys are really, um, your story. Uh, and I encourage people to look on the open floor, uh, dance.org website because there's some nice pieces there and it weaves together a, a nice story about what you guys are doing, but you guys have been uh, an inspiration and a teacher to, to many and whether you knew it or not, you know, for several years, we've sort of, uh, been following you from the periphery. So I really, um, it's an honor for, for you to have us join us on the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's always nice to be invited to oh, talk okay. about our favorite subject. Yes, and I hope we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I do And too. I hope we get to Thank meet you, so you on a dance floor someday. Thank you, Nate. That would be a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. So that's our episode. I hope you guys got something out of that. 
check the show notes out on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. points. If you have questions or comments or just want to connect, please check us out on our Facebook page. Or if you're old-fashioned like me, Google Evolving Past Alzheimer's Podcast, and you'll find us that way. Finally, if you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comment section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. We can. Thanks, and talk to you next time. Thank you.